Keith Perkin um, about complexity of voting manipulation about uh, ties. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Alers. Thanks for coming. I know it's been a long day. So, in case you didn't find your way to the coffee machine, so let me just give you a brief overview of the talk so that you can fall asleep right after that. Okay, so this is the summary of the talk comes in the beginning. I'll repeat it in the end as well. So, when you hear the same words, that's time to wake up. Okay, so this is what we will talk about. We'll talk about voting collective decision making. And specifically, we are going to talk about voting manipulation, how voters can lie about their preferences so as to improve the outcome for themselves. And more, even more specifically, we are going to focus on one aspect of voting that hasn't really been addressed properly in the previous literature, and that's tie-breaking rules. And what we are going to show is that there wasn't a good reason to ignore it. Ties actually matter. Ties are important. So this is what we are going to show. Ties matter. Okay, so let me, start, uh, let me start by setting up the formal notation. So an election is described by a set of candidates, so we'll have M candidates, N voters. Each voter has a preference order over the candidates, so a total order of the elements of the set C, so a total ranking of all candidates. And they have a voting rule. Voting rule looks at all preference, looks at all preference orders, so this is what's called a preference profile. And it outputs a candidate in C, the election winner. So all voters and candidates, the voting rule looks at the rankings, outputs the election winner. Okay, so some examples of voting rules, just to get your feeling for what they're like. So here's a big class of voting rules that are very intuitive. These are called scoring rules. So scoring rule is associated with a vector. So say we have this vector, 75210, usually assumed to be decreasing or non-increasing, any such vector defines a scoring rule in a very natural way. So each candidate receives SI points from each voter who ranks him in position I. So here, if you have a voter whose ranking is A, B, C, D, E, A will get seven points from him, B will get five points from him, etc. And a candidate's total score would be his total number of points and the candidate with the highest total score wins. Okay, so some examples, so classic voting rule when you just vote for one candidate can be viewed in this framework. So that would be plurality rule, rule that corresponds to the scoring vector 1, 0, 0, 0. Border rule is another classic scoring rule. So this is the one that goes from m minus 1 down to 0, kind of step by step, m minus 1, m minus 2, 2, 1, 0. Okay, so these are... Some scoring rules, but not all. These are some voting rules, but not all voting rules are like that. So let me show you a couple more examples, just so that you see how collective decisions can be made. So another interesting example is the Copeland rule. So here, here is how it's defined. So for any pair of candidates, we can look at how voters rank these two candidates with respect to each other. Right? So we can talk about pairwise election between these two candidates. So we'll see that one candidate, A, beats another candidate, B, in a pairwise election, if more than half of the voters rank A above B. And, okay, so if exactly half of the voters rank A above B, then A and B are tied. And now we can define the score of a candidate as the number of pairwise election he wins minus the number of pairwise election he loses. So you, so you can think of this pairwise election, you can think of a pairwise election graph as a graph with, where vertices are candidates and there is an edge from a winner to the loser of pairwise selection. Sometimes there is no edge, this means there is a tie. And then your score is your out degree minus your in degree. Okay, so there are even more complicated voting rules. So another interesting one is maximin. So this, so this is defined as follows. For any pair of candidates, let's say that the score of A against B is the number of voters who prefer A to B. And then let's say that the score of a candidate is the minimum over all these numbers over all other candidates. So in words, so the score, the maximum score of C is the number of votes he would get against its most difficult opponent. So you look at all pairwise elections, each pairwise election, all pairwise elections associated with C, each pairwise election corresponds to a number, how many votes C would get in that election, and his score would be the worst of these numbers. Right, and in both of these cases, the winner is the guy with the highest score. 
Okay, so now why would we care about voting? Well, one obvious answer is political elections, but applications of voting are not limited to that. So some other examples would be hiring new faculty. I'm not exactly sure how it's done here or in other schools, but you can imagine that kind of facul permanent faculty members or tenured professors vote over uh, who to make an offer to, or at least whom to shortlist. So nomination, nominations for prizes, selections, selection of who wins a prize can be done by voting. So these are examples which don't necessarily have a huge number of voters, right? So faculty voting whom to hire, there may be 10, 15 voters, even less if just a hiring committee. Prizes, same thing. So in kind of decision making in multi-agent systems, so this is a bit of a point, a point in the sky. So it's been discussed for some time that in principle, intelligent agents could make collective decisions by voting over alternatives. I'm not sure it's been implemented in any multi-agent practical system, but there's no reason why it couldn't be, right? So there's, a, there's hope that this is how things will be done in the future. Okay, so, okay, so what exactly are we going to study? So the problem I'm interested in is the problem of voting manipulation. So here's the form of definition. We say voting rule is manipulable. If some guy, had some, one of the voters, can lie about his preferences, and get a better outcome for his own. So we say that the voting rule is manipulable if there is some voter I who can submit a non-truthful vote R prime I instead of his truthful vote R I, and he would prefer the result of the non-truthful voting to the result of truthful voting. So he will have an incentive to lie. So obviously manipulation is not good because you want the voters to vote truthfully, you want to aggregate the true preferences, not whatever they whatever they came up with when they were strategizing. So, you want, so it would be nice to have a voting rule that is not manipulable. So unfortunately, it's well known that it's not possible, so that the classic gibbert satterthwaite theorem. So if you have more than two candidates, and you want your voting rule to be non-dictatorial, you don't want your voting rule to just follow the preference of some particular voter, then the voting rule is going to be manipulable. Now the next hope would be kind of now wearing our computer scientist hats, so perhaps this wouldn't be as much of an issue if these manipulations would be really hard to compute, right? Because that would mean that in practical situations, manipulators would have a hard time figuring out this lying strategy. So they couldn't do that, and then maybe it's not as much of a problem. But now, unfortunately, even that hope is crushed, right? So this, this is something that has been shown by Bertolt de Tovey and Trick in 89. So what they showed that given a preference profile, one can find the beneficial manipulation, solve the manipulation problem, find this R prime I in polynomial time for most voting rules. And in particular, this applies to all voting rules I just defined. So plurality, border, and more generally all scoring rules. They don't formulate it this way, but the algorithm generalizes to all scoring rules. Copeland, maximum. Okay, so that's bad news for this complexity as a barrier against manipulation agenda. But fortunately, I'm not, I'm not going to argue that not all is lost. And so here is why. So all these voting rules, plurality, border, Copeland, Maximin, I hope that maybe one of you, I hope that one of you in interrupted me when I defined them, because they are not voting rules as I defined them. Right? They are voting correspondences. Right? Remember, I defined the voting rule as a rule that looked at preference profiles and output a single candidate. Right, and then I defined all these scoring rules, Copeland, Maximin, and they don't necessarily define a single winner. Right, there could be several people with top scores under plurality or top scores under border, any of these rules. So we have several candidates with the top score, so we have a tie. And this tie needs to be broken somehow. Right, and that introduces an interesting complication. So in what sense, so in what sense about all the Tovey trick results hold? For we, what do they assume about tie-breaking rule? And do they need to assume something about tie-breaking rule? Turns out that their results crucially depend on what tie-breaking rule is used. And what they actually assume is that the ties are always broken in favor of manipulator. Or in other words, they say that the manipulation problem has been solved positively if they ensure that the manipulator's favorite candidate is one of the top scorers, one of the winners. So th that's enough for a positive result for them. Now it turns out that with a little bit of tweaking, their result, which is pretty much a greedy algorithm, can be extended to any tie-breaking rule that is lexicographic. So what I mean by that is that there's a fixed priority order over the candidates. 
which can be, for instance, the manipulator's preference order or reverse of the manipulator's preference order or just fixed preference order, and then the algorithm would still work, or more or less, some variant of the algorithm would work. But the voting rules that are used in practice and tie-breaking rules that are not in practice are not necessarily lexicographic. Sometimes we do have to break ties, and sometimes we do break them according to some seniority order, but not always. So the question I want to ask here is what happens to the complexity of voting manipulation if the tie-breaking rule is not lexicographic? So what we did in this work, we looked at two types of tie-breaking rules. So one is randomized tie-breaking, right? To Singapore. So this is Singapore dollar, by the way, right? with a nice flower on it. OK, so the randomized tie-breaking means that if, have, if we have a set of candidates with the top score, we choose the winner among them uniformly at random, right, by tossing a fair coin. Now, what does it mean to manipulate successfully in this situation? Well, let's, since we are talking about probabilities, right, so we should talk about, well, we, we are talking about some random events. So the way to formalize what it means to succeed is to say that the manipulator assigns utilities to all candidates, and what he wants to do is to maximize his expected utility with respect to this random point process. Right? Okay, so that's one very reasonable tie-breaking rule. And another approach is to say, suppose we don't want to assume anything about tie-breaking rule. Right? So let's say we assume that it's polynomial or time computable, because if you want to talk about efficiency, we better assume the tie-breaking rule itself is efficient. And, but, apart from, but apart from that, we don't want to assume anything. So, okay, so I assume here it's deterministic, so these two cases are incomparable. But suppose all I know about my tie-breaking rule is it's efficiently computable, but nothing else. It's given to me by an oracle. So do bertoldi dovi trick results generalize to that case? So, do they, so that would be kind of the best case scenario for their results. Do they hold, in fact, for any polynomial tie-breaking rule? And it's probably not immediately obvious what the answer should be. OK, so these are the questions I want to ask. So do easiness results still hold? for randomized tie-breaking rule and for arbitrary polynomial time tie-breaking. Now let me show you some results. Okay, first scoring rules and randomized tie-breaking. So here the easiness results survive. So here I have good news. So and here, so the theorem is that for any scoring rule, the manipulation problem is polynomial time solvable under randomized tie-breaking. So a brief outline of the proof is as follows. So suppose, okay, so suppose we are the manipulator. Suppose everyone else has voted. So let's just grab the votes. So, so these are the other votes for all candidates. So the bar, there is one bar for each candidate. So now we have to come in and vote. So our votes are also rectangles. So we add our rectangles to the existing one, ones. And now what we have to do, we have to go basically over all possible winning scores. And it can be shown that there is polynomial number of them. And for each of them, we have to figure out what is the best thing to do. So pictorially, kind of, there is about m, m squared li lines, possible levels here, where m is the, m is the number of winners, m is the number of candidates, and we kind of try to peg the rectangles reaching this line so that the average utility from all columns reaching that line is maximum. So here you can see that we have done that, but we, have all, we could also have this guy as a single winner at this level by swapping these two boxes, right? By swapping these two candidates in our vote. And it turns out that this is something that can be achieved in polynomial time. So it's not very hard. So I'm just trying to explain to you what kind of, kind of geometric problem or scheduling problem, if you like, this reduces to. OK, so that wasn't very hard. So let me say a few words about maximum. For maximum, we also have a positive result but only for special utilities. So let me explain what I mean by that. For maximum, suppose our utilities have a special form. There is one guy we really like, preferred candidate P. We assign utility 1 to him, and all other candidates we hate, and we hate them all equally, so they have utility 0. Right, so in that case, turns out again that under randomized tie-breaking, manipulator's problem is polynomial time solvable. So let me give you a sketch of the algorithm. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Okay, so first let's recall what maximum is. Maximum, your maximum score is the number of points, votes you get against your most difficult opponent. So let's look at some arbitrary candidate C. Let S of C be his score before we vote. Right, and now let's see what our vote can do to his score. 
Right? So all of all, in all of all, if we put him before all his most difficult opponents, he will get one point in all his most difficult elections. Right? So his maximum score will go up by one. So that happens if we put C before all his most difficult opponents. But if we put C after at least one of his most difficult opponents, his score will remain the same. Right? So all of all change each score by at most one. So either, either it remains the same or it goes up by one. And this depends on whether the candidate appears before each of its toughest opponents. OK, so now this means, OK, so what do we want to achieve now? So we have this preferred candidate. We want him to be one of the winners. And we want him to be tied with as few people as possible. So what can we do? See, if there is someone who is already beating our candidate by more than one point, we've got no chance. Right? So you did, because this got, so P is not going to be among the winners. Our utility is zero, game over. So we might as well give up. So now suppose this is not the case. Suppose P has a fighting chance. So what we are going to do is, of course, first we are going to rank P first. And here is what we are going to do next. Let's classify all other candidates. There will be three categories. We'll say that the candidate is good if he is currently trailing P. His score before our vote is less than the score of P. A candidate is bad if he is currently tied with P. And the candidate is ugly if he leads P by one point before our vote. Right, so these are the really dangerous guys. Right, and now in this terminology, we can restate our problem as follows. So we'll draw a graph where the vertices are candidates, and there's an edge from A to B if A is B's most difficult opponent. Right, so this is our graph, colors, code, good, bad, and ugly. So this is our preferred candidate. So now our problem can be restated as follows. What we want to do is to sort the, the vertices of this graph on a line, kind of stretch them out on a line, so that each ugly vertex has an incoming edge from the left. Because this means this guy appears after some of his toughest opponents, he's not gaining a point. And also we want as many bad vertices as possible to have an incoming edge. Because this ensures that our guy is tied with all the ugly guys, we can't help that. And there are as few bad guys as possible that he's tied with. Right, and that's a graph theoretic problem, right? You have a graph with vertices of three types, and you want to sort them on a line so that this condition holds. And that can be done in polynomial time. It requires some kind of graph theoretic work. It has a bit of the same flavor as Edmund's matching algorithm, so you have to collapse some vertices, then expand them back. So there's more work to be done, but this is pretty much what happens. OK, so that was maximum for special utilities. You may wonder what happens for general utilities. But general utilities at the end, so this is where interesting stuff starts. So I promised to tell you that ties matter. So this is my first proof that ties do matter. So for maximum, if, if we have general utilities, then under randomized tie breaking manipulation is hard. And it's hard even for utilities that are like in the previous case, but reversed. So in the previous case, we had one guy we liked, and we hated everyone else. Here we have one guy we hate, one despised candidate, and we like everyone else. And under these utilities, finding the optimal manipulation is NB hard. So let me give a very b brief proof sketch. So here we'll set up the instance so that this bad guy necessarily wins. So if you think about, so now we want to maximize the number of winners. We want him to be tied with as many pe people as possible. And that, if you think in, in terms of the graph we've just seen, we want to sort this graph kind of so that as few vertices as possible have an incoming edge. And this should suggest a natural NP hard problem to reduce from. That would be feedback vertex set. And indeed, there is a fairly easy reduction from feedback vertex set here. So, OK, so there's another voting tool I mentioned, Copeland rule. So for Copeland rule, we also have a hardness result. So this, so again, it holds if utility, even if utilities are in 0, 1. So we like some candidates and we dislike some other candidates equally in each group. And, OK, reduction from independent set. So what's interesting there is we can prove not just the hardness, not just the hardness result, we can in fact prove an inapproximability result. Right? Because here we have a nat natural optimization problem. We want to maximize the expected utility of the, of the winner. Right? So you can ask whether you can approximate it. And here for Copeland, we can show that we cannot even approximate it up to a constant factor. OK, so the second class of tie-breaking rules I wanted to talk about was polynomial time tie-breaking. Right? All I know about my voting rule is that tie-breaking rule is that it's polynomial time computable. 
Look, okay. and here we have bad news again, or good news if you if you believe in complexity as a barrier barrier against manipulation story. So we can show that there the exists a polynomial time tie-breaking rule such that in combination with border Copeland and Maximin, so manipulation is hard to compute. So so its combinations with all these voting rules and be hard to manipulate. Right, and the nice thing about this voting rule is, about this tie-breaking rule, it depends on the set of tied candidates only. So the tie-breaking rule look, looks at the candidates that are tied and selects one of them somehow in polynomial time, using a polynomial time algorithm. Okay, and now, okay, so you might notice that plurality is missing from this list, and you can show that if you want to have this condition, then manipulating plurality would be easy. But if you allow more general tie-breaking rules, one that may depend on the entire profile, then even plurality is and be hard to manipulate. And the proof is, okay, so the proof is not particularly difficult. So what you do is you make the winning set, the tight set, to encode a Boolean formula in the truth assignment. And you set things up so that the manipulator cannot affect the Boolean formula, but gets to select the truth assignment. And then the tie-breaking rule is set up so that it checks whether the truth assignment part fits the Boolean formula part, and if it does, it's nice to manipulator, otherwise it's bad for the manipulator. Right? So that's pretty much the proof idea. So the details differ for different voting rules, so there's some combinatorics that comes in, but all in all, it's not too difficult. Okay, so, okay, so to summarize, so I hope that I have convinced you that when we are talking about voting manipulation, ties matter. Okay, so what else? Okay, so what remains to be done? So for Maximin, I showed you the hardness result for general utilities, but unlike for Copeland, we don't have an inapproximability result. So for all we know, it might be approximable. It seems like it might be a fun problem to think about. And kind of more generally, in terms of the big picture, so generally, I think it might be interesting to think about the role of randomization in voting, and in particular, Role of, role of randomization in preventing bad behavior in voting, right? So the other forms of kind of non-truthful behavior in voting, control, bribery, manipulation by coalitions. So some of the existing results in this area do not depend on tie-breaking rules, but some of them do. So for the ones that do, it would be interesting to see what happens on randomized tie-breaking. Okay, so that's all, thanks. Okay, so this is the so this is the model that is standard in the study of coalition manipulation. We assume so we assume that everyone else except for a manipulating guy votes truthfully, right? So we assume that for them their votes coincide with their preferences. There's there's been some work done on computing well Nash equilibrium voting, where kind of all voters may cheat simultaneously or sequentially. But it's a completely different story, and yeah, I'll be happy to tell you more about it. But maybe offline. Okay. Right. It, unfortunately, yes. It means just that. It means that there is no polynomial time algorithm that solves the problem always. Right. So. The problem might, may very well still be easy on average, and again, that's a whole different line of inquiry. Yeah. 